Welcome, everybody, to the Tag Your It podcast. I'm Ray Ray. And I am David Van Beffer. And we are in the studio yet again together. There's no having to call into Buffalo and have you down here. It's good That's to right. have you God. back here in Springfield Praise after God. the day that you've had. So it's just really it's awesome. You know, you're a you're an elder of a church. You're Grateful an overseer. And uh, God uses you. And it's awesome to be friends um, with somebody, um, you know, that's not a part of my congregation, but to also be know, know the life of his, his congregation through him and just everything that he does. Um, tag your ministries or at least me on the other side of that. You know, we like to make sure you know, I like to make sure to be well, able to support him in that because it takes a lot of time to be an overseer, to be an elder and a shepherd of church. So he's been through a lot today. So <laughs> we didn't get the writing. Uh, but like I'm we grateful. Said to I want to say this very but, sincerely. Yeah. I'm grateful. Number one, that I was able to spend time in God's word, spend time in prayer for people. I think that that's an incredibly important thing. You know, so many apologists are removed from the actual ministry to the church. And for me, the podcast itself is a arm of the ministry that God has called me to do. And that is to equip the saints to defend the faith and to contend for the faith once delivered to mm-hmm. the saints, by the saints. And I think that that is an incredibly important element of what we're doing here. And so I'm so glad to be in beautiful Springfield, Missouri. While it is still a mask town, it is not a masked town for me anyway. Yeah. So we talked yeah. a little bit about that before, but we don't need to get into that. This very town much, is tired <laughs> anyway, and it shows. But uh, anyway, we got some uh, really cool announcements, right. uh, things to keep on going. Uh, remember, we do have still have a book out. It yes. is Did God Stutter? And we have some, a new announcement with that. So we've had uh, the Hard copy. We've had the hard copy, yes. And then we've had the PDF uh, available for a donation of any amount that is going to end soon. Um, but one, and, but it'll end whenever. Um, what happens? What did we just do and what's got to be finalized? We have now got... Ta- excuse me. We have now got Did God Stutter available on Kindle. Mm-hmm. So it's ready for Kindle download. So you can purchase it that way and get it on your Kindle reader or the Kindle reader app. Mm-hmm. And so we want to make that available to people. But we kind of wanted to hold that back just a little bit. Some of that was because of some formatting issues that we had. Hefty. Uh, unintentional, but they actually was, that was really good. And so you're still able, if you'd like to purchase the book through the website, we want to make sure that it's available there. In fact, I- I'm going to say we should probably just keep it up there as long as we want. Yeah. You know, there's no, uh, there's no problem with that. So I think that we can make that available as long as we have it. And that's one of the things, if you want to give directly to us and not give, uh, is it Bezos is the guy who owns, uh, yeah. Amazon. I think or maybe he might've so, sat down a little bit too. I'm not yeah, sure. Whatever on that, he is. But. If you don't want to give the, what you might term the evil empire of Amazon, your money, you can just give it directly to us. And all of that, 100% of that goes to keep tag your it on the air and to keep our website up because that's all that we're using that for anything that we take. Just so you know, Adam and I are not pocketing any money from the sales of the book. Everything that you're giving in getting the book goes first, of course, to pay for the actual physical copy of the book, but anything beyond that goes right to us. And we're not taking some massive amount to the podcast, but that allows us to keep the website up. That allows Mm -hmm. us to continue to get the podcast out through all the different platforms that we use. And so that you can see Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, CastBox, YouTube, that allows us to get it out on that format. Mm -hmm. So that way we're not limited to just one single medium we're actually able to get it out through a lot of mediums and so you can have it available to yourself yeah. so, so when you purchase the book that's what it's actually going to it's not making us rich by nope. any means we're certainly nope. not hopefully we'll break even that's actually what we would prefer we're hoping that yeah we hope we break even so yeah, yeah we, we do uh, do this even. as a labor of love out of our own pockets anyway and so anything that comes in extra we definitely uh thank god for it and thank god for you for yes. it as well. So, you know, this it's the way that God provides um by means of people. So we thank 
everybody uh ultimately god for that um also what's coming up we finally got some dates um i mean it's a little bit farther in the future so lord willing but it'll as, be here quickly. as always we, we know it'll yes. always be here quicker than what you'd think yes so. yes by the time we get there it's like oh man uh, about a week beforehand it's like <laughs> do we have our debate cases right? right whatever anyway october 24th is the big one um where the missouri baptist apologetic next apologetics network gets to showcase it's apologists. Um, That's right. And it's a, hopefully a time where all of us apologists can come together um, around a debate. And so it's the debate that uh, we've talked about before. Um, it's uh, Dave and I on, you know, being on a presuppositional side. And then we have Gabriel Zalea and Dennis, uh, Dennis Jackson, Jackson um, which, take, yeah, yeah, the, classical, the classical side. side. And they will, mm -hmm. of course, we will contend uh, with the proposition, what is the best way to defend the faith? And we will say presuppositionally. They will say mm -hmm. classically. It should be a great clash. And by the way, it's not going to be a super long debate. It's a 94-minute debate if everything works out, which means mm -hmm. that if you're there in the conference hotel, you can come down, watch the debate, get to bed in plenty of time. It won't be super late. Yeah. And that will actually include the whole time there will also include a 15 minute audience Q&A. So just like we've done in the past before, you'll have cards where you can submit a question. And of course, the moderator of the debate will ask those questions to the debaters. We'll get opportunities to respond. And it will be a great format where we will have, like we always do, basically a crossfire, a tag you're it. We've generally, in all of our debates, had kind of an open format where we get to interact in more of a discussion format. And uh, we will have a time where we do that. So it should be a whole lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have finally got another little debate, at least the people in the debate laid out. And that kind of brings us into the, the topic for today. Mm -hmm. But before we do that next week, we will have Will Hoffman, yes. not here in studio, but he will call in and we're going to talk about Leighton Flowers. And so it should be a really great program. Yeah, Looking so, forward to that. Yeah. And so, yeah, we got some new, uh, what we call the fel the fellowship of the tag anyway. So it's not only just uh, Josh, uh, Jenkins and Brandon Dodd. Um, it's also Will Hoffman. And so we're going to have him on the show. If you go back into our catalog, he's been on the show about uh, UFOs, uh, Mormonism and stuff. So we're going to utilize him in a couple of different um, capacities uh, when it comes to paranormal, when it comes to Mormonism. And we're going to also add provisional, or the uh, man, the, the listening to it, is really messing with me right now <laughs> listening to myself <laughs> anyway, but provisionalism, um, which, uh, we've dealt with latent flowers on the show before we haven't dealt with them in a long time. Uh, but that's something that will wants to sort of watch for us, um, is kind of what's going on in Texas since that's an apologetic issue, apologetic neck network issue. Um, especially when it comes to Southern Baptist life, uh, you know, quote unquote Southern Baptist life anyway. So he's going to come in and talk about provisionalism, latent flowers, what's being said, uh, what's being charged and, um, you know, how we can approach, um, things when it comes to that. So we are glad to have, uh, Will Hoffman on board as a fellowship of the tag person as well. So it's awesome. Um, so we'll have him next week. And then we've also got another show on the, uh, May 24th, uh, yes. at least live recording. It'll be up the next week as far as podcast goes, um, where we'll definitely talk about, um, some tweets that came from Rhett from My Mythical Morning. We'll discuss some issues with that um, and how it exploded on my Facebook timeline. We'll kind of bring those in and two. The thanks to Gabriel Zalea for his uh, little input on that anyway. Um, but yeah, so there's there's cool things coming up uh, for sure, but let's get into this tonight because uh, the debate that um, we will have, we talked about on the last show, um, but it's definitely finalized with the uh, our opponents, which would be Phil Kahlberg and his cousin uh, Luke Kahlberg. Um, we'll be having that and we're looking at either September or November for that and we're still got to find a place to get that all set up. So not all the plans are finalized but we do have them. They're engaged. They're ready um, to to get digging in and then come to the debate. So that's, We will that part's deal down. with a proposition yeah. and a format. It should yeah. be, a, actually it will be a more extended format than what we'll do at the Missouri Baptist Annual Meeting which will be really nice. Not that there's going to be any problem with the format at the Missouri Baptist Annual Meeting but it'll be a little bit shorter debate there but with Phil and Luke, it's going to be a little bit longer, maybe a two and a half hour debate or so. So you'll get to actually see us dig into the issues, just a little bit more depth. So it should be a whole lot of fun. And so number one, you can do a few things. We always encourage you to pray for the tag you're at ministry. Mm -hmm. You know, we're grateful. Uh, as I told Adam, as I was driving down here, I see 
the podcast as just an extension of my ministry as pastor. This is, again, should be useful for the church, not to try to build up an ego or anything like that. No, no, no. We want to be able to equip the church to do the work of the church. And this is just yeah. an opportunity for us to do that. And, and it's a vital part of ministry in my mind. So that's yeah. why I wouldn't miss it. Even on a busy day like today, I think it's still incredibly useful. Yeah, well, definitely, definitely. So uh, with that said, uh, we want to dig in. This is part two of us dealing with uh, Phil Kahlberg's problem with presuppositionalism anyway. So uh, we will start. um, We were about 15 minutes in. We kind of left off um, with him talking about uh, the connection between um, Calvinism, uh, reform theology and presuppositionalism. He kind of mentioned that, you you know, it's not necessarily so, um, but presuppositionalism it does connect you to reformed theology we kind of dealt with uh, that and so i'll be starting if you um if you do check out the uh the episode from the examine life of you know, with uh, phil kahlberg um, that's where we are it's episode uh 74 uh, on his list anyway and so again we're starting about 15 minutes in and we're going to continue um doing some commentary hopefully you guys learn a little bit more about uh what is stated as presuppositional apologetics or what we like to do um, post uh, Bonson um, with uh, the advent of Scott Oliphant anyway, another student of Van Til um, where he hones in. I think the best uh, thing is calling it covenantal apologetics. Um, So let's uh, dig in starting at uh, about 15 minutes. And once I get this thing opened up here, we are good to go. So here we go. The point was the fact that you find Calvinism and presupposition together so often, even though they don't necessarily have to be. It's very similar to how you often find uh, Catholic philosophers who are Thomists, and most Thomists are going to be Catholics. Although, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. I know of at least two, maybe you three, stop it right there. Thomist philosophers who are not Catholic. A few little things that I want to say on that. Number one, the seminary that was started by Norman Geisler is one of the seminaries. He started two, Veritas, and also he stuttered started Southern Evangelical Seminary, which is where Richard Howe teaches. Mm. So we're grateful for Dr. Howe. We think that uh, we had a great exchange with him. I thought it was a very useful exchange. It was just about a year ago that we actually had that. But if you are not familiar with them, one of the things that you should probably know if you're going to be getting to speak about Thomism is that uh, Thomism has been greatly accepted by the faculty at Southern Evangelical Seminary. If you're not educated on this, uh, shame on you. It's something, if you are dealing with apologetics, that you should know. In fact, there was a book written not too long ago called The Evangelical Exodus, and it was 12 different seminary professors that left Southern Evangelical Seminary because they were indeed Thomist, but they couldn't find a consistency with their Thomism and their evangelical faith. Yeah. And so what did they do? They left protestantism to embrace catholicism so Mm -hmm. in a way phil actually is right here but the problem is there are a whole bunch of protestants who are acting like they're thomist but they're not being consistent and actually you'll find the exact same thing i believe in phil yeah and this is the this is exactly what van till dealt with so if you read any of his works he's going to show you um the problem in um, doing apologetics in a Thomist or a classicalist, evidentialist sort of camp that has been in that tradition. Um, And yes, we can go back to Calvin, but we need to really just put it forward. This is a reformed position. Uh, Van Til took it as the reformed apologetic Um, really, uh, you know, over against um, what, you know, I guess earlier, Um, And in his cast, he said, you know, this is not um, reformed epistemology um, in the Alvin Plantinga sense, but this is reformed revelational epistemology that we're talking about. And there's something that needs to be explained. And I think that it's really important that individuals understand this because sometimes when we use words, we're not trying to use jargon. And so we sometimes assume that people have an understanding of a definition that we are stating. Put simply, Thomism, and I don't want to oversimplify this, but Thomism is essentially the idea that based upon general revelation, in other words... it'd It'd be general revelation or what you could call natural theology an individual is able Mm -hmm. to reason to god so based upon taking the external evidence of the world you can then come to a conclusion that there is god 
some components of that we would certainly embrace because that does connect with Romans chapter one, right? It does connect with Psalm chapter 19. Very clear. I mean, I think that even in a way, Paul is appealing to that somewhat, but not, not completely in Acts 17. But the reality is you have to have a transcendent God, a God who has also revealed himself to know the real true God. And that is the basis from which we would engage in this idea. Hope yeah. that I've said that correctly, uh -huh. Adam. I, I want to make sure that individuals don't uh, just have to go and look up what Thomism is, but they can actually understand the basis by which we are dealing with Thomism. Yeah. And, and really, when it comes down to the whole Thomist issue, what I definitely have and what I've uh, you know read and, and study and stuff, um, Thomism comes out of a copycat issue. Um, so who actually pulled on to Aristotle first? It was actually the Muslims. There's a reason why it's called the Kalam cosmological argument. It's because it was the Muslims that were actually attaching themselves to a, be apologists for Allah and the Quran um, that attached themselves to Aristotle first. And then you see, you know, the, the movement for Christian apologetics. And it was just like, well, we can do this, too. And it's like, no, you can't, <laughs> you know, but that, that's that's where it, it's really a problem is because you have what you have really the blank slate idea of Locke came from Aristotle. Aristotle might have not had been so pushing it, but it was a part of his, um, his line of reasoning is that we have no inner categories and all that kind of stuff. And it doesn't comport with scripture at all because we all know we have the, and he's going to get to this here in a minute about the census divinitatis in a way. Um, but we all, we are created we are a part of creation. So we can't separate ourselves from creation. We are created. And so therefore we ourselves being creation demonstrate God. So we'll find it within ourselves. We find it looking at ourselves. We find it looking at everything outside us. Um, we are rendered excuseless because God is seen, but why is the difference in the difference between our apologetic methodology? But again, very, very rare. So anyhow, to help explain or slash steel man this uh, type of thinking, this system of thought, I, we kind of need to go back to John Calvin. Now, Calvin did a lot of things. He wrote a huge systematic theology, and like everybody else, he wrote a lot. There's plenty to look at there, some good, some bad. But for our purposes here, what I'm talking about is one of the things he attempted to do was establish a uh, framework for knowledge of God, knowledge of theology, that was free of any philosophical entanglement. And that or, is that is an assertion. And nowhere does he actually prove that assertion. So he, his interpretation of things, I guess, is that uh, what Calvin was doing was trying to get rid of philosophy and just have pure theology, pure reason in that sense um, from reasoning from God. So if you open up the Institutes, we've said this time and time again on the show, um, Calvin does say to know oneself is to know, is to know God and to know God is to know oneself. And you, you don't know which one proceeds, right? Cause it's so entangled um, with knowledge of self and knowledge of God. Um, understandably so, but you know, the thing is, is does that get rid of any philosophy on Calvin's in? I don't think Calvin goes against philosophy at all. No, not even close. Yeah, he doesn't and, refute yeah. the idea at all. Yeah. But and, he does talk about a transcendent philosophy, yeah. a philosophy that was given, of course, with the renewing of the mind and demonstrates a fundamental biblical uh, anatomy, right? What is man? And how do we define who man is? Again, when we go back even to our debate with Richard Howe, we basically said, do you have a biblical anthropology? If you have a biblical anthropology, then you're not going to be able to uh, allow yourself to say that man within within himself can reason to a transcendent God. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. And so that's the deal is um, even down all the way to back to Van Til. Van Til's not against philosophy. It's just that we have yeah. a Christian philosophy of life because well, we have a worldview because Christianity is a system. It's not a parts and, parts and pieces issue. Um, we are given revelation. We, are, we have anthropology explained. Yes. We have things explained. And no, do we have everything? No. It says the secret things is Deuteronomy 29, 29. Uh, the secret things are God's, but what has been revealed is for us and our children. Um, so we can work with what has been revealed as necessary, as authoritative, as sufficient, 
as as uh, what's all uh, let's say clear yes so <laughs> perspicuous necessity and, clarity yeah, yeah. sufficiency clarity sufficiency the theory authority yeah. inerrancy yeah so with there those those things there you know that's you know that again this is a whole systemic thing we have a philosophy based on the starting point of god's condescension so this goes down to uh westminster and london baptist and uh savoy whenever you get to those why do they say that we could not have fruition of god being our blessedness and our reward and and we couldn't attain eternal life or get 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 life the reward of life without his condescension by him talking to us, by him coming to us, which is why Calvin says he lisps to us. He is greater than us. He's his, his being is greater. It's separate from us. And it's like if we were going to try to talk to our dog, right? Our dog's not going to understand unless if we make the initial move to go, here's how you shake and you keep on doing. That's what God does with us. And he teaches us, but it starts with him coming down to us. And it's by way of covenant that he was pleased to do these things. So again, this is a, not just a Calvinist thing. This is a reformed thing, but Calvin was the best, one of the best and, expositors. And again, here's one of the things that Phil is going to assert, and I don't want to jump ahead, but he's going to say, well, essentially, and actually I think he did, I think we actually listened to this last time. Essentially, uh, people like Van Til and Kuiper just made this up based upon Calvin. Well, you have to remember when you read the Institutes, who is it that Calvin is quoting again and again and again and again in every chapter multiple times? Augustine or Augustine. Augustine. Yep. Who was Augustine? Well, remember, he really shaped the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. He was there at the Council of Nicaea. So it wasn't as if Calvin was some ignorant guy who is just making something up, he actually had church history on his side mm -hmm. and was saying, wait a second, we exited this. We did so gradually. We need to get back to where we actually started. Yep, and that's the issue again with Augustine is his uh, ecclesiology and his theology were at odds with each other. That's the whole division and the whole Reformation issue. Um, so yeah, let's continue various reasons which are not entirely important here he wanted to be able to present christianity present the gospel as free from any philosophical entanglement and in his mind that meant you've got to get theology freed from all these ideas that you see coming in from plato aristotle and other philosophers so that's so, the issue though we want to get it untangled from plato aristotle zeno uh, the stoics whatever and guess who was present in Acts 17 whenever paul went to the Areopagus, who called him a seed picker? Who invited him to talk about his foreign I, d, d, uh, divinities? It, who, who, what was there in Athens at the time? So let's do grammatical, historical hermeneutics here. Yeah. Let's, Certainly let's the go back. the Stoics were there. The mm -hmm. Epicureans were there. Where was the academy located? Right there in Athens. Where's the Lyconium? That's Plato and Aristotle right there, right? Yes. So what's wrong whenever Paul tells us not to go to these philosophies because they're empty and they're vain and they're deceitful? Again, here's where the Reformation comes into play. We have sola scriptura. The difference between being a Catholic or at least a Roman Catholic at the time, here's the divide. Who speaks? Who is, the, who, who is wise? It is God, and it's the fear of the Lord who is the beginning of wisdom, and it's the knowledge of the Holy One that's insight. So the, here's the big deal. So yeah, Calvin wanted to, he was a reformer. He wanted to get away from the worldly philosophies that had creeped in, and they wanted to reform things. And this is why, you know, presuppositionalism is a reformed apologetic, and that's why we call it a covenantal apologetic. Well, the issue becomes when you embrace natural theology, it's the foundation from which you are basing or springboarding into your philosophy. Calvin didn't want to do away with philosophical nope. thinking. Neither does Paul, by the way. And of course, that was the basis by which Calvin was trying to return, the basis by which Augustine was even 
affirming in the 300s was, do you have a philosophical foundation that is based upon a worldview that rejects the triune God of scripture, or do you have one that is grounded in the revelation of the triune God of scripture? Paul makes this very clear, Romans chapter 12, when he says that you are going to renew your mind very clearly, when he talks in 1 Corinthians that the natural man cannot reason in and of himself. When he says that man is dead in their trespasses and sins, that means everything. So Mm -hmm. when you embrace a biblical anthropology, not a natural, not naturalistic, but a external um, position concerning man's anthropology, what you're doing is you're springboarding forward into how does that thought progress? And if you have a faulty foundation for human anthropology, then you're going to have a faulty apologetic or a faulty approach each time basing the ultimate standard upon something that is external to scripture. And that's exactly where Calvin is going. That's why in the Institutes, he starts where he does. And of course, everything progresses from there, by the way. He starts with God. If you've not read the Institutes, that's where he begins. Yeah. That is, you just want theology and God, none of this philosophy garbage, according to Calvin. And I'm very... Again, that's just not... say it's a straw man. That's all. I, I, prove it. Show what me is where... What is interesting, by the way... Yeah, I, show me where Calvin says, I don't want philosophy at all. Well, and here's the thing, and I think this is so funny. It is humorous to me, because Phil says, let me steel man this. If you're not familiar with that, let me make a better argument than what was being made originally. That's what a steel man argument is. I'm going to make a stronger argument than what they actually originally said. No, 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 no. This is a straw man, not a steel man. Loosely quoting here. I'm going to be very loosely quoting virtually everyone I refer to here. All of them, more or less, had a lot to write and say about these things, but it's impossible to go into them in great detail in an hour-long podcast. Now... If you've been listening to my podcast, then do for a while, multiple podcast. Yeah, yeah, we're <laughs> doing like we're doing. Yeah, not not to be superior, but if it's if it's such a big deal, do more podcasts. Cite your sources. Help us out here. I hope that immediately you're going to hear when I tell you that Calvin wants to establish knowledge for of God of theology free from philosophical entanglement. You're going to go wait. That that's impossible. That can't be done. And you're absolutely right. That's the imp- because it is a straw man. Media trouble that you come in. It's just impossible to do that. And to their credit, mo- I would say most of the prior theologians and. Uh, Christian philosophers before uh, Calvin actually recognized this and attempted to take that into account. Who were they? Who were they? Cite them. Tell us who they were. I'd like to hear who these individuals were. If you're going to say Aquinas, again, you're starting with a very interesting position. Aquinas rejected a biblically informed anthropology. That was not where he was. He was going back to the Greek philosophers, the Stoics, the Epicureans, even the Islamic Yep. philosophers well, it was a uh, thomas aquinas was going back to aristotle sorry i mean that's not the not put, the muslim yeah. because they weren't around yeah. at that point no, sorry no, was, i got that confused and i want to correct that basically uh you have muslims and christians adopting aristotle like we're talking about augustine and how you have protestants and catholics utilizing the same person right that's the same sort of deal that's happened in there Although I don't, I'm not a Thomist, so I wouldn't buy into Aquinas with everything. He actually had a pretty uh, sophisticated, pretty good epistemological outlook that I would uh, recommend highly. That I think it's, if not entirely right, at least mostly right. More right than it is wrong, anyhow. What is it? You said something about it. What is it? That was actually one of the points I tried to make in that debate with uh, David Van Beveren. I don't know if he just didn't get this or didn't understand or didn't want to concede in the debate. Is you can't really do knowledge of any type without bringing your philosophical ideas to bear. You just can't. I yeah. never. Just to make this, I never rejected that. I said, and maybe Phil didn't get it, and maybe he still doesn't get it. Do you have, and I'm just hammering this down, do you have a biblical anthropology, or do you have an external or human reasoning anthropology? What is your view of man? Are they corrupt? Are they dead in sin? Is there a difference between the natural man and the regenerate man? If so, how do you get there? Yeah, and this is the same issue that we ran into with uh, with Howe and Tucker, Anyway, it's just going like, we will have, before we even open up a Bible, we will have some sort of worldview, all right? So we're not rejecting that you come to Scripture. With a philosophy. With a philosophy. We're not rejecting that. Or without a God. Or without a God either, by the way. Yeah, yeah. 
but we're going to come to Scripture, we're going to read it, and if the Holy Spirit comes upon the heart of the individual, and then they read it, they're going to be like, wait, I thought I was good. I am bad. There's nothing good in me anymore. I realize that. So they're going to end up having their philosophy change because the Scripture, the Holy Spirit using the means of Scripture, hopefully community around them too, to change, to renew their mind, to give them the new birth and all that kind of stuff. So again, another straw man, our position doesn't reject that we come without philosophy to scripture. No, we have what we have. In, Everyone in us. has a philosophy. Yeah, everybody but does. Do you have a right one? And how do you test that? Yeah. And yeah, again, uh, by what standard, which is something I yeah, actually, I so, gotta do this. I'd never done this and this is, I've had this for a while, but my friend, uh, Jeremiah, uh, yeah, gave me some, he gave us some really cool stuff and it's a really awesome, uh, stamp. And, uh, it says, if you can read it, all right, by what standard it's the, by what standard stamp. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stamp this, uh, piece and this is what I'm just going to hold up. So I don't have to say anything, but yeah. By what standard? All right, <laughs> but that, that's the thing. We we don't reject that because we we get everybody's going to come to scriptures to the word with a philosophy, but then they're going to have to align their philosophy with scripture, thus making Christian philosophy, which is exactly what Van Til talks about. So unfortunately, I don't think he goes really that. Uh, I guess we need to get to that point. But he spends a lot of time on Calvin. He spends a lot of time on Kuiper. But then again, throughout time. We got time and, and things develop over time, at least in, on our end, um, trying to be conformed to the image of Christ, ultimately the whole church being conformed to the image of Christ as well. So this is a whole uh, holistic issue that is so narrow sidedly put into a podcast. And I believe the quote I read was from the uh, excellent philosopher Karl Popper, where he explained that if you say and claim, I'm just doing this stuff without philosophy, you're just deceiving yourself because that is a philosophy. You're just, and now you're just doing philosophy very, very badly because you haven't gone through and examined what your philosophical ideas and biases and preconceptions are. And By what so standard is it and, done really hey, poorly? The whole point I'm trying to drive home repeatedly in this podcast is examine your life, examine your philosophy, examine your ideals. And do well, here's the problem real quick. The g- great statement. I agree with that. I think that that is right. You do need to examine. Yeah. But the problem is when you examine them, what are you testing them according to? Are you testing them according to an empiricistic view of reality? Are you testing them according to what your mind tells you and your feelings and, and even your conscience? Or are you testing them according to what scripture has given you what the Holy Spirit has given you. And yes, there is a standard by which to test things. That is for a regenerate person, scripture and the Holy Spirit. Once Christ has breathed new life into you, you have an objective standard through which to understand whether you are thinking correctly. Yeah. And here's the deal. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so how am I supposed to, to, to test this stuff? By what standard am I supposed to? By my three pound brain, my, my three pound uh, finite brain. Or if I'm supposed to test it there from God, maybe God has revealed his will that I can test things by. I mean, what, what is it going to be? Is it going to be by Aristotle, Plato, or is it going to be by God's revelation that he's given in ultimately Christ, through Jesus Christ in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Oh, so we actually have access to the objective treasures of wisdom and knowledge who entered into this world. Mm hmm. Yep possible and that includes even like how you would have access to the knowledge of god you can't get you simply cannot claim i've detangled my knowledge of god from my philosophical ideas and you can't no that one has said that. in yeah. fact actually what i would say is you start detangled from the actual god you start rejecting mm-hmm. that god you cannot if scripture is right you cannot reason your way to that god no one will be able to do such a thing. The natural man rejects. So the problem is 
when you base your philosophical system upon individuals who don't hold every thought captive to obedience to Christ, you will never get to Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, one possible explanation for Calvin's inability to see this was that when he was writing, his primary concern was not in establishing like a good, grounded theological system to fight against atheism or skepticism or something like that, but it was rather the theological fight or debate between the new Protestantism he was a part of and Catholicism. Well, here's the issue. Very interesting. The new Protestantism that he was a part of. What Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, Melanchthon were after was not some new thing. It was a rejection of the drifting that occurred. Yeah. They were going back to the standard through which the prophets spoke. When the prophets say, when when Paul says, all scripture is God breathed. When Jude says very clearly that we have what God has said, essentially contending for the faith once delivered by and through the saints, what they are appealing to is what God has already declared. When Paul says in first Corinthians that he is speaking scripture, when Peter says that people deceive and twist the words of Paul as they do all scripture, they are appealing to this transcendent truth that was revealed through the prophets to God's people. Also, I think you can make a great case, and this is done for the quest, done in the book, The Question of Canon, that the early church believed God's word would actually stop when the prophets, the apostles, cease to exist. That's why they quit it, continuing the canon when you read the early church and they actually keep quoting back to these individuals that we would say are the apostles. We can actually construct the new Testament through the writings of the early church fathers. Why? Because that was a standard. Mm -hmm. So when you say I'm going to hold natural reasoning as a secondary or as a secondary piece beside scripture, Instead of saying the renewed mind from scripture will actually correctly interpret scripture, you get yourself into a very serious conundrum. What Phil is doing is he is, again, if you listen to the start of this podcast, it's poison the well. That's all it is. But likewise, it says that it's a Catholic podcast. Yes. So he's acting consistent with a, with a Catholic standard, which is not a evangelical or Protestantly informed understanding of scripture. Yeah. Again, he is as a Baptist churchgoer on a Catholic network. He is actually arguing against the formal principle of the reformation. <laughs> that's the, that's the hard thing. Um, and so that's where we're at. It's, it's going to be is Phil, are, are you a Catholic in that sense? Not in the, just the, the generic term of what Catholic actually means that I have no problem with, but are you Roman Catholic? Are you going to end up holding on to the council of Trent sometime and well, Vatican II? And, and the reality is, is fine? the reality is if you're a Baptist or a Protestant in any way, and you're listening to this podcast, you need to recognize that he's being inconsistent with his Protestantism. Do you want to jump onto the Catholic apologist train or are you Protestant for a reason? And do you understand that you are Baptist confessionally for a reason, or do you think that you can synthesize the two worldviews because they are different gospels? Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, at the end of the day, we do not hold hands with Rome when it comes to the doctrine of salvation. And therefore, when you're dealing with apologetic methods, the goal is not to win someone to believe in a God. We would tell you everybody believes in a God. That's scriptural. Even the person who says, I reject God, has still placed themselves in the position of God and said, I'm God. When we talk about uh, a very hardcore atheist, when we talk about someone like a J.T. Eberhardt, we're not saying 
that guy doesn't believe in God. No, no. He actually demonstrates that he believes in a God. He is God. He is the ultimate arbiter of truth for him. He is the ultimate arbiter of morals, of values, of how you interact with society. He's placed himself on the throne. Everyone does that. Yeah, and it's basically if you take Greek, if you if you, if you take Greek uh, mythology and all that stuff, everybody at that time would have been still recognizing they needed something transcendent, and that's why you have all these gods, and it's polytheism, um, and then atheism comes around to where it's still Greek and philosophy, you just get rid of the transcendence, make it eminent, and then we all become the gods. So it's okay. still the same problem of polytheism. It's called relativism and subjectivism. Doesn't work, but apparently if we make it humans instead of just some transcendent transcendent idea of gods being out there and it's just us that is darwinism that's <laughs> that's how we get all this kind of stuff um which that'll that that part will come up anyway um but that's that's a problem so you know which one are you phil are you going to be a protestant are you going to be a catholic here um i'm thinking you're siding with uh with the uh, with rome on the issue until you don't want to Inside, it kind of makes sense that because Lay Aquinas was a good Catholic, many of the good theologians and uh, philosophers, Christian philosophers that had come prior to Calvin were also good Catholics because with a few exceptions. There is, way. that is a arbitrary term, good Catholics. What do you mean by that? Were they good Roman Catholics? Because the reality is that even at that time, there was not a total what I would say, total loss and conflation of what we would now term Roman Catholicism. Yeah. There were individuals that affirmed or accepted yeah, certain be... dogmas of the Catholic Church, but there was not an inline step of, yes, we're all along the lines of Catholicism. Does that yeah, make and sense? It's, it's one of those things, because like, you know, the, the, the church, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, you know, you look, look at you Protestants. And look how many denominations, it's like a big schism and stuff. It's like they were still schism. It's just they utilized the power of what? the state to shut people up. I know, many, I know many people who say that they're Catholic. How about our president? The president of the United yeah. States says he's Catholic, but he says it's yeah. great to kill babies, celebrate killing babies. Oh, and you can call marriage whatever you want. But yeah. guess what? The Pope doesn't say that. While the Pope conflates on a whole bunch of other things, yeah. it, it is very uh, obscure about his definitions of a lot of other things. There's just two things that he's actually somewhat clear on. Yeah, but uh, to, yeah, to say good Catholic is to really be anachronistic at the point. Yes, at least uh, in, in today's today's understanding. In some sense or other, a Catholic for the Protestant Reformation. Well, then. Maybe for that reason, Calvin didn't really want to look at what Aquinas had to say. There would be kind of inclined to. I, I would say that that's say. false. Aquinas is quoted in the Institutes. Mm -hmm. I will say that I don't have the Institutes in front of me, but I've read enough. I've read enough of it and looked at the footnotes enough to know that he quotes. He does. He really likes to quote Augustine, mm -hmm. but he doesn't just quote Augustine. And so to say, and what was asserted there was essentially that Calvin was ignorant of Aquinas yeah. or didn't want to deal with Aquinas because he was a good Catholic. I, I think that that's, a, no, that's an false. assertion that is fallacious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Prove it though. <laughs> but, and that's just kind of speculation on my part. I don't really know if that's the case or not. It's exactly now, the primary idea of Calvin's here that is important is that he takes the idea of original sin and expands upon it into the idea of total depravity. While original sin has certainly been a core Orthodox Christian doctrine as for as long as there's been core Orthodox Christian doctrine, Calvin, in a certain sense, we can say strengthened and expounded on this. To make so a few things on that real quick. Number one, the idea of total depravity doesn't start nope. with original sin, or are you ready? With the Catholic Church. It was the Jewish position on human anthropology, according to Scripture, excuse me, biblical anthropology, that goes back to David in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. In sin did my mother conceive me. Bingo. Already written. The curse, if you understand the federal headship, that the Jews actually understood, which was their basis for needing a Messiah, as seen in a good biblical theology, the Redeemer in Isaiah was going to take the sins of everyone upon himself. Why? Because human beings were dead, doomed to the core, 
evil. Every thought on their heart was evil. Oh, wait, where did that come from? Go back to Genesis chapter six. All that man did, every thought of his heart was evil. That didn't come from Calvin wanting to have a understanding of total depravity. It comes from the Jewish understanding of humanity. That's why God had to choose a people for himself because no one would choose him. Notice again, going back to Genesis chapter six, when it says in Genesis chapter six, every thought of man's heart was evil. It then says, and God found favor in Noah. Why? Because no one could think good or do good on their own. God had to find favor, had to give grace to someone had to open someone's spiritual eyes. Yeah. Oop, I just started to do something here. Oh, I'll hit sorry. Now. Uh, you might want to say stronger than it had seemingly been in prior theologians. At least prior theologians, to my knowledge. If you, there had been 15, 1600 that years. Would be because, be that would be fundamentally because what has happened is Greek philosophy, Epicurean, Stoic thought infiltrated into the mindset well, of the through, church. Through Thomas Aquinas especially. Again, Aristotle presupposes the perfectibility of a man and that man is not, man just makes mistakes with his mind, but he's, it's not bad. But the Bible says differently. It's not just the heart is bad, it's just the mind is darkened um, and there needs to be a renewal of all faculties in the Old Testament makes that it, it speaks to that it's explicitly speaks to that so um the issue of reforming the church was that well initially again martin luther did not want to he didn't come in as a revolutionary trying to destroy an institution he wanted to reform an institution so you know we can't look at martin luther like uh, what people are trying to do today as some revolutionary we're trying to tear down oppressive institutions no he wanted to say it did become oppressive but he wasn't lawlessly going against lawlessness he recognized a standard and a law to go i don't want to destroy this we just need to reform it we've gone way over well, and here this is the very hope of yeah. the gospel though. Yeah. this is this is why this is such an important piece for us to deal with the very hope of the gospel is that christ saves man cannot save man cannot somehow allow his mind to be renewed in and of himself this is a key gospel issue man is dead in his trespasses and sins option one or option two man has an ability to reason to god is that going to be consistent with what scripture says yeah. Is that the biblically informed anthropology of humanity? See, the gospel is so good because man is so bad, not because man is so reasonable. Yeah. And then so whenever you inherit Greek philosophy and you and you syncretize those and you synthesize Greek philosophy with, uh, I guess, piecemeal Christianity. Um, you 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 can't you can't have a depraved person. And that was the problem. And again, your yeah. theology will inform your apologetic. And notice it was Martin Luther that wrote the bondage of the will, by the way. It's not Calvin. So it's Bingo. not just Calvin either. Yeah. So Melanchthon it's a reformational have, issue. Melanchthon would have put a ditto on it too, probably, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Since he was Calvin or Luther's understudy. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. There's some people before him that did it in a similar way that I'm unaware of. That could be, I don't know everything. But generally speaking, the idea of total depravity is regarded as coming from Calvin and not of any other theologian, at least not that I'm aware of. So Again, that, that's such a, that is an anachronistic view of total depravity. The real question is, what did the Jewish faith believe about man's will and about man's moral good or ability to do moral good? Yeah. If... Scripture is consistent, which it is, because it comes from a God who it cannot lie, then we can see, based upon the Jewish roots of the Christian faith, Calvin didn't just pull this out of thin air in order to try to affirm his thing. And actually, if you read the Institutes, by the way, and you hear what Calvin says about total depravity, he doesn't just base it in the New Testament or in his own reason. Fundamentally, it starts with the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. Yeah, yeah. One of the asserts here is that sin not only affects our moral status, that is, because of sin we're 
morally unable to do right, we sin and we're morally blameworthy, those kind of things. But it also affects our intellectual status. That is, it not just hinders us morally, but it makes us unable to reason well. It makes us unable to recognize what's good, right, and true. So a few things, sense. and I think that there's some conflation there. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I think that it's a common one, and it's easy to make even for yeah. a good a good Calvinist. When we talk about man's ability to reason, yes, certainly it is impacted by sin, but there's a different mode of reasoning in reasoning in spiritual things and reasoning in natural world things. Yeah. Certainly man's ability to reason in natural world things is going to be impacted by sin, but man's spiritual reasoning, is in, it's impossible for man to reason to God, to the triune God of Scripture mm -hmm. in and of himself. Again, speaking from the consistent view of Scripture and the consistent voice of Scripture, Paul makes it clear, man can't reason in spiritual Yeah, things. and it's one of those things, it's a, it's a can't-won't issue. It's not just a can't issue, it's a can't-won't issue. Well said. Uh, so, they won't. Um, we, we can say that they have no ability, but it's also a won't. So, even if they had the ability, they wouldn't, even though, it, but it is scripturally, I have to bow down to scripture because I have to go, since everybody goes to an expert, right? So I'm not doing anything out of the ordinary. I'm going to go to an expert. I'm going to go to the omniscient God who has condescended and told me things, right? And I'm going to believe him as the expert that knows the beginning or the end from the beginning and created all things. So he fits the bill of the best expert ever who has spoken and has given us all these, all this wonderful stuff. And so it is a can't won't issue. Again, it goes back to the garden. Whenever autonomy was the issue, I can, I can judge the moral issue over eating the fruit. It, you know, is God holding something from me? Is he not good? It all comes back down to that. It's not just a New Testament issue. It's not just a tradition issue. It is a getting back to Scripture, sola scriptura, and and again, which which path are you going to go from the Reformation? Are you going to go stay in the Tiber and go on the other side? Which which side of the the river are you on? And uh, apparently, again, uh, the the big issue that I'm getting from this, he doesn't have a problem with presuppositionalism. That's right that he has a problem with presuppositionalism. His, his problem with presuppositionalism presupposes his hatred, his distaste for the, 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 the reformed theology. Yeah. So he doesn't really have a problem with presuppositionalism. He has a problem with, but it does recognize the issue is if you are reformed, you really actually have to be, presuppositional, which is our case. And that's why we talk about R.C. Sproul and other people who are reformed who are not presuppositional. It's like there, there's a conflict. Well, it comes down to a piece that I find in a lot of individuals who don't like reformed theology. They want to be in the driver's seat. They want to give themselves a little credit for their coming to God. But scripture says, you don't get any credit for that. That is dependent upon God's choosing. Oh, but Dave, you're trying just to be too pious. It has That's nothing to mean, do with yeah. pious. It has everything yeah. to do with giving God all the credit. Exactly. And so it's not, and we're not trying to be pietistic to build ourselves as holy or anything like that. No, the scripture says, I don't know how clear more clear than just that the scripture says this that excludes boasting that uh abraham didn't earn what he got that's right that israel was chosen not because they were righteous not because they were big but because why because god that's the way god wanted to do it and so they can't take israel couldn't take credit for being a special people based on anything that israel was other than based on the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which then later became came out of the Israel, which ultimately goes back to the promise of Adam, to Adam and Eve after the fall, that there would be enmity between the seeds and that uh, he would send someone to crush the head of the serpent. It all comes down to God made his promise that he didn't have to make to man, 
and God gets all the glory. So it's not me being pietistic. It's me being sticking to the text. If I do not have that, then I cannot know. And then we're stuck in, we can go to the enlightenment and we can say, we can, we can posit all we want out here, but we don't know it. And so we have to just stick in, we can, we prove anything outside of our heads. And then it becomes relativism, subjectivism. That's why the enlightenment failed. And we're stuck here in the postmodern times where objective truth is even out the window. So this is why, you know, free, like in the Freemasonry debate, the whole secular issue and joining that, why, the, why it's going down, the, the recruitment is going down. Why? Because we've lost objectivity. <laughs> you know, that, you know, so when it, whenever we've had all these discussions, there's a reason why we are here today. Um, and it's still, it's us acting like the Greeks. The church was acting like the Greeks back in pre-Reformation time. That's why Reformation happened. And here we still are debating the same stuff. There's nothing new. In the intellectual sense, in the sense of uh, how we reason and think about things as well. And the only way out of that, according to Calvin, is through grace from the Holy Spirit working within us, through revelation from God. Whoa, 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 whoa. From Calvin? From Calvin? Is that just from Calvin? From Calvin? So Calvin was the first one to come up with the idea that God gave man new life. I think uh, Augustine had a Pelagian controversy where they kind of talked about, um, you know, who's, who's at the bottom of the hole and what's his condition. There you go. It so. wasn't just with Calvin. In fact, again, who is it that gives eternal life? God. Notice that in the New Testament, it isn't pray that God will give you insight so that you can accept. It is pray that God gives you, that God changes you. Not that you put a new heart in your own self. Yeah. You're not going to give yourself spiritual heart surgery. Just going back to Ezekiel, take out my heart of stone, give me a heart of flesh. That's the gospel. Mm -hmm. Raised to new life. What can a dead man do? Not, of course, original with me. That is the reality. What can a dead man do? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got almost another hour anyway, and I think uh, <laughs> we can we can do a part three anyway, yes, um, we probably next to. week and stuff. So uh, we've only had one, one show scheduled, so we can do a little bit more next week uh, with our writing and stuff. So uh, again, just to... You know, we don't want to impose on your time, but we um, thank you and, uh, for allowing us into your life again uh, for another week on the live cast, another time um, of listening to the podcast. We, we, we are grateful for that. Um, but, you know, just to conclude, um, you know, here's going to be the major issue. Um, we are going to debate this and it's going to come down to it's not going to come down to methodology. That's right. It's going to be even back of that. What is theology? And then this is the issue. If you don't treat the scriptures as what they well, are, as what they say they are, the inerrant word of God, this is where you where you are. That's going to be the issue, Adam. So we're going to have another inerrancy you, debate. Here's what I would encourage each of you to do. Mark my words, May 10th of 2021, whenever this debate occurs, here's what's going to happen. We are going to present scripture we are not going to be refuted with scripture. So then you need to ask yourself very seriously a question. Anyone who listens to this, is scripture your authority or not? That's what it comes down to. At the end of the day, do you truly believe that God speaks and raises man to new life or man does his own type of spiritual the, uh, CPR on himself, pulls out the paddles on himself, his dead arms takes the paddles and puts them to his chest and hits shock and life begins. Is that what you, does man have the power to flip the switch of regeneration? Yeah. Yeah, and this is, you know, this is the big issue. This, then this gets into, again, though, well, so we talked about the formal principle of the Reformation. This gets into... The practical principle, justification by faith alone, and then how is that faith gained? The question will be, and we will frame it very clearly, if you are a Christian who holds every thought 
captive to obedience to Christ. Man, I say that over again. You know why? Because I pray that for myself. Not because I'm again, I'm not trying to get some type of false piety. Yeah. I want to know what's true according to God because he is truth. Sanctify them in your truth. What? Your word is truth. One of my favorite passages as well. Yeah. And it's what Christ prayed for. Bingo. Listen to that debate when it happens in November or September, whatever we end up, ask yourself, who is able to deal with scripture? Who is able to exegete scripture? Who is able to apply a consistent hermeneutic that is actually derived from scripture itself, which I always think is so crazy that how in that debate would say, well, where did you get that hermeneutic? From God, he is not going to leave us empty handed. Again, we can do some philosophy post scripture and it's okay. Again, this is a, this whole time it's just been based on a straw man anyway that we're trying to untangle theology and philosophy. But no, no, to know God is to know His reality and to move in His reality. I think so His thoughts pragma- after Him. Yeah, pragmatism isn't so bad since we don't have everything given to us and we have principles. Again, the regu- the regulative principle is a very pragmatic tool to go. Here's principles. Here's circumstances. How do we do that? Same, same thing works in theonomy as far as how a civil government should work. How, again, it's not just the regulative principle of the church. It's the regulative principle that God has given us. He's given us principles. He has given us his will. And he's asked us to repent because of the kingdom of God being here and uh, has, has called people to himself to live on mission um, here in this life before Christ comes, um, redeeming everything. And, uh, and, and that's whenever the, the creation is redeemed and the, and the sons of God are presented and everything. So, you know, so we can't, so pragmatism isn't bad. Philosophy isn't bad, but is it God's philosophy? Is it God's pragmatism? Is it God's principles? And, or is it man trying to, again, try to look around and see what they can come up with um, because of the fact of they can't shake. They can't shake God because they are, again, made by him, so they can't shake him. And so are you going to worship the creature, just studying theolo- studying natural theology and worshiping the created things, thinking that you're worshiping the true God? Or are you going to actually trust that God has actually spoken and has been a good God that spoke to you and let you know who he is and how to work and be, have dominion like he, he's, he's asked you to do and that you actually are, walk, can walk pleasing to him or beat yourself up all the time because you don't know if you're really pleasing him or not. You're just hoping. And again, in that situation, you can become a Muslim and that's why it worked with Aristotle. Or <laughs> so Plantica. Same, same thing. Or yeah. Plantica. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, with that said, uh, you know, we'll, we'll end the show, but we thank you guys again for, well, for she your actually time. said Anthony oh, flew, Anthony flew. flew. Yes. There flew, you go. Not yeah. 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 But anyway, uh, thank you again for your time. Um, thank you again uh, for being a part of this. Uh, please like us on Facebook. Tell your friends to like us on Facebook. Subscribe, Subscribe to us to on YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. We saw a couple more subscribers on there anyway. We've seen some uh, more views and everything. So again, thank you uh, guys so much for um, supporting our ministry, just even by just watching and being there, but please uh, interact. Um, come on the live podcast and, and, uh, and, talk to us on, in the comment box while we're podcasting, email us, uh, just whatever. We want some more connection with you guys. Um, and, and ultimately hopefully we'd come meet you guys at your church or something like that. That'd That's be right. even off, even better. So anyway, with that said, this is the tag Europe podcast. I am Ray Ray. And I'm Dave. And so Dave. Gloria. Gloria.